every month or so, it seems like billions more are going to Ukraine. Is that the right policy? What would we be doing if Michael Flynn and Donald Trump were back in the White House? Stick around. We're going to show you right now. It seems week by week, we're not getting towards an end point. We're burying ourselves there. It gets worse every month, financially and um, politically, in terms of we're making statements, like you mentioned a few minutes ago, General, we're, we're allowing them, according to what I've read, to use our weapons to cross the border and hit targets inside Russia. What should American policy be going forward now regarding Ukraine? There has to be, uh, there's, you know, it, and it's not going to happen with this administration, number one. So, so take that off the table. It is not going to happen with this administration. So if we are lucky and we have an election in November and that election is relatively fair and Donald J. Trump uh, becomes the president of the United States again, then he immediately needs to sit down with Putin and probably other world leaders and say, we're going to, this is going to stop. This is going to stop here and now. The United States of America is no longer going to be part of this foolishness. And, and he needs to point at NATO and say to NATO, NATO is a defensive charter. It's a defensive action. It's a defensive alliance. He needs to tell the leaders of NATO to back off, back down. Okay, America's back in charge, and we're going to start making some decisions here to calm this situation down so we don't go to a nuclear war, which God help us that we actually could, could that could happen before we even have an election. That's how close we are. So, so there's got to be a sit down of strong leaders to sit there and go, this is going to end. And now you get into the negotiations of how it's going to end and how it's, and you know, it's not about splitting up ukraine and deciding how ukraine's going to be no it's about living in a neighborhood with all of the challenges that we have but without conflict that's possible you know have conflict by how much you're going to charge somebody for a bale of wheat or a, or a barrel of, of oil because there's a lot of trade that goes back and forth with with ukraine and with russia always has and with ukraine and other parts of the world in addition to it being a, uh, a laundromat for weapons, drugs, humans. I mean, Ukraine is a, is a criminal enterprise run by a criminal thug in Zelensky, who our dummies allowed him to come and do, gave a State of the Union you know, address in, in, uh, in Congress a couple of years ago in a, in a sweatsuit. I mean, give me a break. So we need strong leaders, and that's what's going to have to happen for that. The other aspect about the Middle East, because these are tied together. You can't do one without the other. And that includes China and what Chinese activities are out in the Pacific or, in, or Chinese activities in the Panama Canal, which matter a great deal. 70% of, of uh, U.S. trade, 70% 70 of U.S. trade goes through the Panama Canal. If the Chinese own the Panama Canal, our ability to trade is crushed, crushed overnight. And, and they are doing everything they can to control the Panama Canal right now because we are so distracted with all of this craziness that, our, that this government, this administration has gotten us involved in overseas. There were, there, these wars weren't, weren't at, you know, going on. I mean, hell, Trump was the first president in my lifetime that didn't start a war. Biden has started another conflict in Europe. He has, I mean, weaponized the conflict in the Middle East by, by promoting Iran. I mean, the Houthi rebels who get all of their there, which are down in Yemen, they get all of their, their command and control, they get all their weapons, they get all their training, they get all their money, they get all their resources from Iran. We're firing these long range rockets surface to, to ship missiles at US naval vessels. <laughs> 